hey everybody i told them you were the real minnesota miracle man i'm like that's tommy hello everyone kevin is not here but we have a special guest to i don't know replace kevin is is a bit of a strong word we have longtime quack light longtime writer hannah on the pod hannah thank you for being here I'm very, very excited. I was going to mention this, but I don't even know if you guys would remember this, but years ago, I sent you what was like one of the first like nominees for the first quack question of the year, which mm. was which of the Mighty Ducks is secretly gay. And I've answered that question now. So yeah, <laughs> it'll be interesting to get into that. <laughs> yes, it will definitely be something that we talk about. We have H- Hannah on because I don't know, it was a few months ago. I don't remember exactly February. when. February, Hannah sends me this thing and says, I wrote D4. And it, it is like almost, it's maybe shorter than like a full length movie script, but it is incredible. So we were like, we got to have Hannah on. We brought her on. She's here. She has D4. We have D5. We have D6 to get into. She's got the whole universe scheduled out. And I think this will be helpful as we expand the Mighty Ducks universe. You know, once we get through phase three, We're going to need to go through the movies there. So Mm -hmm. Hannah, thank you for being here. Um, Let's, let's start at the beginning though. Uh, Well, very active on Mighty Ducks, Twitter and that kind of stuff. How did you just get in to the Mighty Ducks and how did this become like a passion for you? Um, So I am a little, I was not alive when the movies came out. I was born in 97, Mm. Um, but I have two older cousins and they were, their favorite movie growing up was Little Giants, which I know like you guys talk about sometimes. So that was like my favorite movie growing up. And then I, me and my sister love the Sandlot and we just started watching, you know, kids sports movies throughout the years. And when I was, I think in middle school or maybe early high school, I caught the Mighty Ducks on TV and I loved it. I mean, I they're big comfort movies. I always come back to them. I I have jerseys from the movies. Like I just always come back to them. Um, as I get older, I find new things to love about them. Like as much as I, I'll probably have to say about Bombay and that journey in this podcast, I really do appreciate his journey in the first Mighty Ducks. And um, I actually I also wrote an analysis a while back about why D three is a great movie. Because I think mm. it gets a lot of shit. But D3 is my favorite of the Ducks, and it always will be. Well, it's too bad Kevin's not here. You guys would be... Uh... <laughs> I can never tell if he's kidding or if he's serious. No, he's very serious. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah, well, he's right. It is the best one. So have you written, like, other stuff outside of the Ducks? Or do you just more focus on the Ducks and that sort of expanded universe? Um, I've been writing fan fiction since I was probably like 14, but I was always a writer growing up. I have like a whole like universe and my mom's going to listen to this and get mad at me, but (laughs) I have like a whole universe that's been in my head since I was like in seventh grade that I've like never done anything with because I'm just too scared to write it. But like with the ducks, I feel like I know it well enough that I can hopefully write something that fans will be happy with. What what's what are some other fan fiction you know topics or um I, I guess uh, universes you've d- you've dabbled into? Um, well, I love Dawson's Creek. Um, mm. Obviously, big Joshua Jackson fan, as you know, evidenced by the script. Um, me and my friend have a Dawson's Creek podcast, uh, which we record every week, but I'm very bad at remembering to <laughs> record it. Um, I used to mm, Stranger Things. I got I've gotten super into, even though I have issues with it. Um. Futurama, I think, is the best show of all time. So I'm very into Futurama and writing stuff for that universe as well. Excellent. Impressive. Big Futurama fan. I've actually never seen Dawson's like a single episode of Dawson's Creek. I, I don't. You gotta, you gotta watch it. Uh, my mom and I, when she watched D three with me, there the scene where like Charlie's talking to Linda on the bench. My mom's like, he's just so charismatic in everything he does, and I was like, well, yeah, that's <laughs> that's Casey Witter. So you gotta watch it. Yeah. Give a plug for the podcast. Uh, Yeah, we are at True Love Pod on Twitter. At True Love Pod. There you go. So let's get into it. So you wrote D4 mm-hmm. and you you did a nice thing and you gave us like good credit for, you know, it, it revolves around the Pond Hockey Championships, which was like kind of our idea. But like you took it way beyond anything we did and you changed it up 
very much. So like I I don't think that it's really like we deserve much credit for it. I think it's very much your own idea. How did this whole thing come about? Why did you want to do it? Why did you want to write it and and you know get it out there to the world? Um, I think right now we're kind of living in an age of nostalgia fueled me- media. Uh, which I think is a good and a bad thing. Like, yes, I do think that we should be coming up with new ideas, but at the same time, some I think Fuller House ran for like six or seven seasons or something crazy like that. So people people do want this material. Um, I'm going to be perfectly honest. Uh, anyone who was involved in writing or show running Game Changers should not be allowed anywhere near the Ducks <laughs> universe ever, ever, ever again. Because even just centering it, centering it around Bombay was such an amateur choice. Oh. And you assume that they tried to get Joshua Jackson and Joshua Jackson said no. But for me, what I really wanted with D4 was to center it around Charlie. Because I think our nostalgia is we, when we were kids, Charlie was a kid. And now we're adults and Charlie is an adult. Whereas with Bombay, he's been an adult when we were kids. And now an adult. And like you guys have talked about this. Does Bombay ever learn anything? Like it's just we're rehashing the same stuff over and over again. And um you know, are, are, we're spoiling the script, right? I'm allowed to spoil it. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna have yeah, you do a little say, summary. So tell us what happens on like page one. So the Ducks for D4 is based, I think, in like 2020. A light, the ducks are 40 years old. And Gordon Bombay has recently passed away. And it is the story of Charlie coming to terms with the loss of that relationship and the grief and the guilt that comes with it, as well as reuniting with his, you know, found family from all those years ago and coming together to take down the Hawks once more and also just keeping a legacy of the the true ducks alive. And so um, there are two kind of new characters in this. And we meet them both very much in, you know, the, the first scene. Um, and that is Charlie's wife, Amy, and six-year-old son, Liam. And so, you know, the way I see this script, it's, you know, Charlie is now the father figure. He's the Bombay figure. Now, uh, I recently had a baby. Um, Mike right. has a couple of daughters. Um, every year they come out with, like, um, the baby list, like, top ten names or whatever. Yeah. And so tell us about Charlie's son's name. And how you came up with that name? Because that is all over the top ten list for like black. <laughs> um. So I I'm a preschool teacher back in New Jersey. I was just I told Tommy this, but I used to I work in Disney right now, but back home in Jersey, I'm a preschool teacher, and one of the little boys there is named Liam, and I just am like obsessed with that name now. I think it's so cute, and it's also very Irish, and I think the Conways are probably very Irish. So there you go. Very good. Uh- all right, so let's let's just run through for those who didn't read the script and are listening to the pot. Let's just sort of run through the main beats. So we we open with Charlie. He's a teacher, not very happy with his life. We learn Bombay essentially dies in this car crash. Was it a car crash or something else? It was a car crash, yeah. Car crash. Okay. I wanted to make I was like, should I make it something a little skeevier for you guys, but <laughs> I stick. It's it's supposed to be realistic, so we're sticking with the car crash. Are okay. We that he was drunk, or was there alcohol involved? Or... Oh, interesting. We can assume that we can definitely assume that. Okay, yeah, that would be like a good Easter egg. Like when yeah, exactly. Charlie's reading the story inside the actual story on his phone. It says like, "Oh, he blew a point yeah, one two sure. BAC." <laughs> uh, so, Bombay has died. Charlie's not happy with himself. He. There's a sort of reunion of the Muddy Ducks at the pizza place, which I appreciated sort of like tying in Game Changers, but not really tying in Game Changers. So there's, yeah, there's a good ideas that there were some good ideas there, though, that I incorporated into this. Yes. I do think Connie being a state senator was great. Specifically, I like Adam being a lawyer, even though I I do not believe, I don't care what Stephen Brill says, there's no way Adam didn't make the NHL. So. So, yeah, so there's a reunion type deal at the pizza place and it sort of devolves into, you know, Charlie lashing out. There's a fight. He goes outside. Fulton 
cheers him up, and then they see this poster for the Pond Hockey Championships. Charlie gets an idea. He could live his his you know childhood again, get the ducks back together. That that sets them on their way. Uh, you know, they practice, they call, they get everybody in. Um, we learn Banks has played for the Bruins, is now retired as a lawyer. We learn Julie Gaffney played on the Olympic team, uh, but everyone else kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah. And um, we learn again that the Hawks are there. They're, they're still the Hawks. They've been practicing and it's setting up this big pond hockey championship showdown. Uh, that ESPN is covering, which I I like because ESPN Plus covers like l- minor league lacrosse. So yeah. I think this is legitimate. Like no, they ESPN definitely, Plus, especially coverage. like they played in the Junior Olympics, like they would definitely cover this. Yeah, so for sure. Yeah. So anything, I guess, anything like really important you want to point out before you know we get to the pond hockey championships? And what are, what are sort of the important points people need to know? Well, who are the ducks that are back? Because you you say there's like eleven of them, right? I think I think there's well, there's twelve, not counting the cameo at the end, which you know we'll get into because that <laughs> I was like, we're not, this is not probably going to happen. So, um, it's Charlie, Jesse, Adam, Connie, Gee, Averman, Goldberg, Julie, Kenny, Portman, Fulton. Fair enough. Um, yeah, so they they start practicing. Uh, as Connie's got a hookup. They're they're sort of not organized. Connie's got a hookup, and we get Ted O'Ryan comes back, and it really sets up, you know, Charlie, and it really reveals Charlie's been like battling with this grief and regret, and all that kind of stuff, and like it's kind of the theme of you know the the script there is you know Charlie's battles with like being adults versus his childhood and what was left unsaid with Bombay and things like that. Um, Where did you take that for? Like, was that obvious to you to the like center it on that kind of stuff? Or was that something that you really had to like, you know, worked through? So especially with what happened with game changer season two, you know, I know you guys just did the pod about Emilio's pitch. Um, Emilio was never, ever going to be in a ducks centered material ever again. Disney is not that dumb. They can't trust him. He's not going to be back. Um, and as, listen, I I really did want to see Charlie and Bombay in Game Changers, and I was very disappointed that we didn't get that. But grief is a very universal emotion. Like, everybody can relate to those feelings of regret and lo- grieving and loss. And, you know, Charlie is someone who didn't have a father, And then he got a father figure and then they just kind of grew apart for reasons that we, I don't get into because I don't really think we need to get, I don't really think we need to know quite honestly. I think it's just that they drifted apart. They always want to, it's kind of like in, um, in home alone, the story with old man Marley and his son, like maybe there was a fight, but neither of them really want to call because it's just awkward. And that never happened. Um, And again, I think centering it around Charlie it's, you know, I think it would be a hard sell to get Joshua Jackson back. Like, he can claim all he wants that he would come back. He's lying. He would not. Because um, if he has, then he's not coming back. However, even though I hope and pray that he would. But I think to have any other duck leading this, um, they're just not big enough names. Even, like, Keenan. Keenan wasn't, like, a big enough part of the franchise to, like, lead like a new generation, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it would have to be Josh Jackson, you know, Charlie kind of coming to terms with fatherhood. Um, and obviously, I mean, that's D1, you know, and D2, I, you lose that because that really yeah, is about... I, I don't care for D2, so yeah. Um, it's, but I think D- that's like the least D- emotional of the three. Yeah, no, you're definitely right. But D3, it does come back to it. And it's kind of like, you know, Charlie's got to go off on his own, really. And you know, become, you know, a man basically without a father um, or, you know, Bombay is kind of letting him go off on his own. And and so, and, and you're kind of imagining of D4, you know, it's definitely like, you know, Charlie is essentially trying to go back to his childhood where he was, you know, happiest he was. And, and one thing you, you mentioned in the script, 
is that it's clear that, you know, Charlie and his wife's relationship is a little bit strained. And it's, you know, because I guess Bombay's death and, you know, Charlie's kind of lack of a father figure and, you know, he's got to be a dad to his son. You know, that's kind of what I, you know, see as the main theme and, you know, how the death impacts him. Um, but yeah, so we've got all those characters coming back. Um, was there anyone who you're just like, did I want like other, we talk about a cameo later in it. Was there any, anything else you kind of toyed with for kind of getting this core group together? Um, well, you know, all of the D2 ducks are in it except for Louise, but you know, they're not with certain legal situations. I don't think Disney would be too keen on getting Mike Vitar back. And also I just don't think he would come back in general, but um. I did give smaller roles. Like I really wanted to give Julie a bigger role, but I, I can't, what's, how do you pronounce your actress's name? Colum? How do you pronounce it? That's what I say. Yeah. Yeah. Colum. I don't know how you say it, but (laughs) I don't, I don't know if she would come back. I basically based who I think would come back off of who still does ducks events off of who came back for game changers and off of who did ducks based events. Um, And Goldberg, I think has to be in it. Just because, I mean, I'm not, I'm like a Goldberg anti, like, I do not care for him. I think Sean Weiss, like, Sean Weiss's performance carries that character because he's just so funny. But Goldberg is just, mm -mm. (laughs) mm-mm. But, and I think it would be a really good move for Disney to invite Sean Weiss to be back in the movie after everything he's been through. Um, I think that would be a, a great move for them, actually, and a kind of inspiring story for a lot of people who went through something similar. So, but again... I gave smaller parts to the only people who really have like big parts are Charlie Fulton, Connie, he, Adam and Jesse. Cause like, I mean, those are like the main people anyway, like that people care about, but everyone else, I'm like, would they come back? So it, that also teeters on that. And so real quick Goldberg. Now he's back in Philly, but he's like fit now. Right. You know, I don't, I was thinking about this because Sean Weiss is obviously lost a lot of weight. Like he's not a bigger guy anymore. So, I mean, I guess I, uh, he is, he does have like a YouTube channel where he does like sandwich reviews just because I thought that was funny. Yeah. But, I love that. Yeah. But which like literally nobody watches. He has like a hundred subscribers <laughs> and he like has a That's Patreon. Funny. Like he's one of those people, but yeah, I mean, I guess we can imagine that he's, I mean, I don't believe in fat suits, so I think he would have to be fit, uh, but he definitely is not a good player. I don't I don't believe this D3 trying to trick me into thinking that he's a good player. He's not. So, you know, Julie obviously had to be in goal, and, you know, we'll get into the actual game, but I was, like, mad at myself because I was like, oh, Julie's letting too many of these e- easy shots in. Like, she would never do that. So, you know, but, yes, Goldberg – very you know that would have to be talked about and toyed with i think and so ducks get back together and they're um you know the antagonists are it's it's the hawks again and so um what made you choose you know the hawks and i guess are the hawks now are they like these pond hockey like beer league 40 yeah 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 yeah. they're like they're like like the hot shit in the area or they think they are just because I don't know. They all just, they're those kids from your high school who never left your town and never made other friends and just never moved on from that point of their lives. Um, Having the Hawks back, I think is the most nostalgic route to go. I mean, obviously everybody remembers Iceland. If you ask like an average Mighty Ducks fan, they'll be like, who was the bully in the third one? Like people don't remember that, but they do remember the Hawks. So I think that was, the best way to go and also like Adam specifically has legitimate beef with these people or like or they have beef with him I don't think he really gives a shit but so I think that was an interesting angle to go I did go back and forth on it just because I know that Mike Looms who played McGill passed away and I didn't want it to be disrespectful or anything in that regard um but you know it is this is probably not going to happen it was in, in my in my dream this will happen but it won't so, you know, I did go back and forth on that, but I really wanted to bring back McGill and Larson and the rest of the Hawks for nostalgia because I do think Game Changers' biggest mistake was not relying on nostalgia, was trying to create something new, and kids don't kids don't care about that. Uh, like I told you, I work in Animal Kingdom, and I see 
I've I've only been here a month and I've seen like three kids in Charlie Conway jerseys. And so for your for the Hawks in your in your mind in D4 and your D4, what what happened to Coach Riley? Is he, is he dead? Is he retired? Is he in Florida? What's what's he doing? Um <laughs> I would say he's honestly probably in jail. <laughs> because like there's no way that nothing had come out over the years about because he definitely is the type to be like trying to get kids on steroids like there is just some shady business going on with Riley so in my mind he's in jail which you know maybe that could be like an easter egg like in Lars's um Hans's grandson's shop maybe there's like a funny article like Jack Riley jailed or something like that um but you know he could also be dead I think it's up to interpretation yeah, and so so you mentioned you know Lars and you know obviously the skate shop was was big in D one um and again you know D three um I guess D two in the beginning so yeah. you decided to create Lars yeah um, well I created Lars that's his character <laughs> I okay. also stole that from you guys yeah yeah I'll put I'll put our original in the show I think it was like episode one hundred it was a yeah, long it was time like ago. a long time yeah so yeah. But yeah, we we needed a we needed a bridge from Hans to the present day or whatever. So I think we put Lars in there. Um, so I I, mean, I think we've touched on everything. Like the thing I like about it is like there's some good nostalgic points. Like they play with the eggs, but like it's it's not just like oh we play with the eggs. Like they end up breaking the eggs and it turns into like a fun thing. It's not like the actual drill and things like that. So taking the nostalgia, twisting it, I thought was really well done. Thank you. Now, I think we've touched on everything other than the Adam and Jesse deal. And do you just want to go into just explain that whole sort of relationship there? Well, from I, your I would love I would love to hear you guys' reactions because I really wanted to surprise people with with that reveal in the script because I do think I did like an okay job at hiding it up until obviously the penultimate scene. Yeah, and so I remember. So I, I finished reading it today um right over a couple days there is a part like kind of in the middle of the script where like i think like um just like he puts his hand on like adam's hand kind of like as a like hey it's okay man and you know, normally i i think you'd see uh in heterosexual you know kind of guys you know in the locker room it's like the arm around the shoulder whatever which is of course more contact but here you know the hand on the hand i was like oh okay that's interesting um and so i kind of thought maybe there's something there and and of course in your uh, in the intro of your script, you know you you mentioned you know wanting to diversify with some of the characters. Like, okay, I think we're we're gonna get um, something a little bit more modern. Um, so that was kind of what clued me in on it that you know uh, Adam and um, and Jesse you know had feelings for each other. Yeah, there were like there's like two or three little moments where you're kind of like, what what is happening here? And then there's like a big sort of reveal uh, near closer to the end uh, that they're together. The thing. Like my first reaction was like, oh, this would never work in the real world. And then my second reaction was, I think it would be really funny if it did happen. Because like you'd get all that controversy about like, oh my god, yeah. they put like a gay relationship in this and like all that kind of exactly. stuff. Exactly, they'd get press attention. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. Which I think is so funny when people like freak out about that kind of stuff. Like, who cares? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, those are my two sort of uh, conflicting reactions. Like, this is never gonna work, but it would be funny. Just uh, just for the, you know, just to make people mad more than anything else. Yeah, uh, exactly. So I, I do think, I think the Ducks as a series has always been very progressive. Um, I think, you know, hockey is, you know, known for being very white, very, very male. Um, so even like just having Connie and Tammy and Julie on the team, I think was really important back in the day. Because as much as I love the Little Giants, like there is some stuff in there that doesn't hold up all that well, with, especially with Ed O'Neill's character. Um, and I really wanted to put some gay representation into the script. And I thought about it for a while because I was like, okay, well, it's not going to be like Kenny or like someone that like nobody really cares that much. Like it has to be like a big character. And like, for me, like Adam has always read a little like gay coded. And I thought like the best way to showcase his development and especially Jesse's development is showing that these two characters have grown to care for each other, um, especially in the scene in the car at the end where Adam's like freaking out about going out, um, having his last game and like failing. And Jesse says, you're the best thing that ever happened to the Ducks and the best thing that ever happened to me. 
And I was so proud of that when I wrote that. I was like, oh my God, I'm like a genius. Like I was so proud of that line specifically. But I think that line is really there to showcase the development of those two characters specifically. And I think making it so essentially um, excluding, you know, Fulton and Portman, um, it's kind of like, you know, maybe the the two, you know, stereotypical like masculine, you know, tropes from earlier movies where, of course, Banks is like the star player. Mm-hmm. And Jesse's kind of like the, the original tough guy. Obviously, you have the Bash brothers, but in D1, you know, Fulton's very quiet. Um, and Jesse is kind of the hothead. Um, and so I think it works well. I think the um, the easier route, if you wanted, um, you know, a, a kind of like a gay representation would be, you know, like, oh, Kenny Wu is the the stereotypical yeah. figure skater, or like, oh, Julia the Why Cat. I didn't want to do that, yeah. And and by not doing that, um, it's it's so much more successful. But again, it's like, yeah, you people would see that, and, and some of them would would riot. But like, that's that the point. Me piss, but I think a lot more people would be happy about it, because um, I think. Um, you know, I, I know just from being in this fan base that the Mighty Ducks does have like a very large like LGBT following. So I do think that for the most part, I think people would be pretty happy with it. I do think that there would be some backlash. Like, well, why do we have to, ooh, but you know, it, it's 2023. I really wanted some representation in there. And I think that overall, I think that that was the best route I could think of for both of those characters. Yeah, it's funny how like upset people get um, about fictional characters when they find out who they sleep with. Yeah, yeah, like why do we care? Like, I don't know. It's, <sighs> but yeah, I was very proud of of that aspect specifically because um, I do know that you know I think a lot of people would be like, oh, like what about like Charlie and Adam? Because that's like the ship that I think a lot of people are more into. But again, it has to work for Disney. Disney's not going to make the main character gay. It's just not, they're not going to do that. So uh, the secondary characters, they'll do, but they're not going to do it with the lead. All right. So again, we have, we have started with Charlie, this teacher, his relationship with his wife is rocky and he's, he's, you know, not feeling very good about himself and all this. So he's gotten the ducks together. He's sort of turned them around. Orion comes in. Connie calls into Ryan to help coach the team and we hit on all those different aspects and we we get to the game here. Uh yeah, do you want to take us through the game? Tommy, do you want to take us through the game? I feel like I've talked a lot here, so I want to yeah. pass it off. So it and so it's just like a one-off, right? It's just Ducks versus Hawks. Yeah. One game. And so um what Liam is like a little assistant coach on there and there's a good scene of um oh I want to be you know um you know I want to be a hockey player I want to play for the Ducks whatever he's only six um but he's on the bench you know um coaching and so we get to the game um so Hannah why don't you take us through the game because I originally thought like you know they got Banks and Julie the Cat shouldn't they be like slaughtering the Hawks (laughs) Hawks they're just like a team, like they play together. And so they, they are good. And so what what's your take on this final game? So again, I don't like rereading it because I literally, I wrote the script in a day. I sat down at like 9 a.m. and I finished it at 9 p.m. <laughs> so I wrote this thing in a day. So when I reread it, like last night, I was like, God damn it. Because I really, I wish I had made it longer, first of all, but I also like the game you're right like they have banks and julie like they should be destroying the hawks but you know it makes for good drama for there to be like oh are they gonna win are they gonna lose because it's like yeah like these no names from minneapolis are gonna be an nhl player and an olympic athlete like no that's not it's not realistic but the ducks has never been known for its realism so um basically they're getting like canned the first the first half of the game the defense sucks um the hawks are like really going after adam hardcore because they just can't get over something that happened 30 years ago and uh liam is you know coaching from the stand very very cute um and then we get into um right after the first quarter or the second quarter. I don't remember how it works. Um, whatever, like, the halftime in quote part is. 
Um, they go to the locker room, and it was right after I think Kenny and the Bash brothers were like riling up the Hawks, and it's very it's a callback to D two, obviously, which has like oh, this is so cheesy, but I have to put it in here because people like you can't tell me that the fans wouldn't go crazy for that. Like you can't tell me. So then obviously they do the like, oh, who are you? Like, where are you from? And uh, they all go around and Orion joins in. And then we get uh, a Russ cameo. And uh, this is my one of my favorite jokes where they ask Russ about his Saturday Night Live audition. And he says he's not leaving until the guy who's been there for 20 years leaves, which I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> I, re- I do wish I had more humor in the script, but it is what it is. <laughs> Yeah, and then one thing is Portman is kicked out of the game, essentially. And it's like the same thing, like, oh, that's intent to injure, you're out of here. And so it opens up that roster spot for uh, for Russ Tyler. Um, and so I thought that was a, a fun nap bag. And like in Crack Lights, go go read the script. Um, because there is a, there are a lot of good lines, you know, that are callbacks to, you know, the um the original trilogy. My and one favorite, thing we- my other favorite was um, haven't you guys been practicing in 25 years? You know, I knew we forgot something like that like stuff like that like people like it's cheesy but people will love it like you can't deny that and there's a lot of like um there's a lot of like flashbacks in the um it's it's not like oh thinking back and you're just eating up time but there's like flashbacks there's obviously the parallels and so the end of um you know the game it's you know it's like tied 4-4 I think and then there's penalty shot um and I think this is probably my favorite is um basically they all like who's gonna take it and they're all just like, well, Charlie, obviously, you know, because of course in the first D1, it's like, what about Charlie? And even like Goldberg has a line like, well, this time I am going to back Charlie or something like that. Um, so Charlie's going to take that penalty shot. So why don't you walk us through like the ending there? Um, You know, I think it's important to end on a tearjerker. And I think, I mean, like if I, I mean, I literally wrote it, but I was crying. My mom cried, which was kind of funny when she <laughs> wrote this. Um. Basically, Charlie goes up to take the penalty shot, and we hear Bombay's voiceover, like, I believe in you, Charlie, win or lose, that whole speech. Um, And, you know, he triple dekes, he makes the shot, uh, and we get, I don't know about you guys, I I don't know if you guys have ever addressed this, but, like, for me, like, I grew up on the We Are the Champions at that part. Like, I didn't grow up on, like, the Ducks, like, the Ducks score is iconic, but, like, I remember We Are the Champions. Oh yeah, hundred yeah, percent. That was like D three. I remember they're like, "Where's the We Are the Champions?" Like they don't have it there, um, because they had it in both one and two. So I I really wanted like all the money. The, this entire budget is going to getting that song and getting Joshua Jackson, and that's all I care about <laughs> with the budget. Um, and then you know we kind of have the like, Ducks celebrating, like we have like Connie and Guy making out, and like Fulton and Jesse are like shielding their kids away, which is pretty funny. Um, you have Charlie like celebrating with his mom, um, very similarly to the end of D3. Like, I'm proud of you, Charlie. I love you, mom. But also a parallel in itself to Bombay and Hans at the end of D1. Um, and then we have the current owner of the Ducks comes up to Charlie and asks him if he will coach Pee Wee's next year, which leads us into D5. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing I did not get into that I kind of want to talk about is the Charlie O'Ryan rift. Um, I, one part that I thought was really funny was when Orion was like telling Jesse, okay, like, we're well, just going to work on your defense. I never coached you. And Charlie's like, oh, well, what do you mean? Like you, what you think Bombay is a bad coach? And Orion's like, God damn it, Charlie. No, I didn't say that. Like, he's already like, I can't fucking deal with his shit. So that was pretty funny. And, um, I really, I actually think Orion is a better coach than Bombay, like, I don't know how anybody can dispute that. Um, so I really wanted to have him in there. And I think that Charlie at the end gives, I he, he gives him the trophy and he says like, and Orion's like, and he's like ducks fly together. And again, like that is just payoff to a relationship that I don't even think we got like a great closure to in D3, even though I love D3, but I really wanted to showcase that because while Orion was not, I think, a father figure to Charlie in the way that Bombay was, I do think he definitely cares for him and was like that authority. He was like his teacher, like he was an authority figure in his life. Um, so I did want to have that in there. And I also 
I don't know, the whole game thing, I'm like, ugh, I wish I could rewrite that because it's not, I'm not super proud of it. <laughs> well, well the good news is you can. Yeah, you exactly. Yeah. I, w- I was thinking like, you know, okay, dialogue is probably the hardest. And then I, I read it, I was just like, these action sequences, I don't know how you write that. Like, that just seems so difficult. Um, um, and- I went back and I read the D1 script. <laughs> Then I tried, I literally just based it off of that. Cause I was like, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to like get terms incorrect. So I kind of <laughs> just based it off of that. Um, and real quick. So you mentioned Orion. So yeah, it was interesting how, um, you know, in, in your script, oh, Charlie's clearly kind of got like, you know, chip on his shoulder about Orion. And the way I kind of read it is that, you know, he's like Bombay's dead and he was the one Orion is alive. And he doesn't even know that I'm hurting that Bombay is dead. He's acting as if Bombay is is, is not dead kind of thing. And so it's like the angsty Charlie um, is is back. Um, so I still, I think that plays well into like the whole, again, like a replacement father kind of thing. Um, and so him handing like the trophy at the end, like I think there were like good visuals for that and, you know, Ryan taking that. And it's also, you know, I, I think that's a good example for, for Liam. And so are you seeing T5 as Charlie coaching Liam? Um, okay, so there's a li- there's a bit character in the script, Noah, who's Charlie's student. Um, have you guys, I don't, have you guys ever watched Boy Meets World? Were you fans of that show? Yes, that was the first thing I rewatched on, Dis- or watched on Disney Plus. It was a rewatch, yeah, because I watched it like Friday nights. Part of it really holds up and then part of it really does not. <laughs> um, so there's a storyline in the early seasons where Sean is taken in by Mr. Turner, his teacher. And, you know, we're going to learn in D5 that Noah, I mean, it's hinted at in this movie, like when Charlie's like buying him breakfast, like it's kind of hinted at, but we're going to find out that he comes from like a troubled, like abusive household. And Charlie is going to see something in him and he's going to really want to, put him on the right track like like very similar to how Bombay came and put him on the right track in D3 um but that'll also be about Charlie coaching the Ducks I don't I really I really like Liam and I really want him to be incorporated in D5 but I think he's a little too young that's the only thing but a kid's age so fast that like by the time D5 would even get made he probably the actor probably be like 11 or 12 but so he probably would be old enough but and then and a whole other subplot would be um, like Noah is like, like we learned this in this one, like he's like obsessed with Banks. Like he thinks he's like the, you know, the great one, like he loves him. So like that would be like a funny subplot with like him coming in to meet Noah very similarly to how um, Gretzky came in in D2. So thoughts? I, I was thinking because like I was like okay Liam's six and you kind of talk about oh he's he's a little young and there's a reference script like oh he's a little young to be playing for the Ducks so I wonder if you did like three years later where he's nine or something and Noah's eleven and it's like Charlie's been coaching them a little bit and he's finally like okay Liam now you're big enough but maybe Liam isn't good and yeah. so it's kind of like he's, spa- he's spaz they call him spazway that would be a good yeah one. and so he's yeah. got to reckon with. I really want to win and like it's important for for Noah to win because like this is all he has like and if he's like he needs to get to practice early and he's like busting his ass because like maybe hockey is a way for him to you know get a college scholarship or something but he's like maybe giving more attention to Noah than he should be to Liam Mm -hmm. and Liam struggling not only with hockey but with school or something like that Um, and then there's like a rift with like uh, Charlie and his wife so maybe you could do something like that and um, I don't know how you wrap a bow on it um but essentially it's yeah it's i don't i think d2 went a little crazy with the goodwill games um which is like i mean that's everyone's favorite so like i'm not gonna like bash on it but that one's a little base like more out of reality than d1 and d2 are so i don't want it i want it to kind of be like a little empire strikes back like a little darker but also not go too far so it would have to be like obviously there has to be the big game at the end so, you know, I have to I have to think about this, but also how I incorporate the other ducks into that. I'm not entirely sure about. Mm. I think maybe having like Fulton and Portman come talk to Noah could be interesting because, I mean, we're kind of I don't know about Portman, but like with Fulton, like we kind of are meant to insinuate that he's like a street kid. 
So I think that could be an interesting choice. I think what you could do is um you could kill Noah in D5. <laughs> he dies in like, you know, uh, some kind of like accident. Like it's he was in the wrong place at the wrong time because, you know, Charlie wasn't there to like, you know, take him to pick him up from practice or something. And he's like, hey, I got my own kid to worry about. I'm not your dad kind of thing. And then you know, Noah's in the wrong place. Um, and so he has to reckon with that. I don't know if Disney would go for that. Uh, but <laughs> Killing a child. Yeah, it would definitely make for an interesting story for sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, I wanted I wanted to do more with Noah in D4. And then I was like, I'll leave it for D5. Like yeah. This will just be like an Easter egg. So what about yeah. D6? See, I, I have no clue about D6. This is where <laughs> I look at you guys. After D5, what do you think? Is like, are they just go back to Eden Hall? Like, what is the? Oh, because I no. honestly, I would love, like, I want to pitch this for the Ducks Extended Universe. I think that they're like, a, they should have been a Friday Night Lights esque Eden Hall series in the nineties. That would have been could, awesome. Um, I would have watched every second of that. Yeah, you could do um, D six is Liam goes to Eden Hall, mm -hmm. um, and Charlie mm -hmm. takes a step back, and it is like Friday Night Lights, you know. Liam's 14 or whatever so it's again like a four-year jump and he's you can if Kevin were here Kevin would be lobbying hard for you know like get some drugs in there make yeah. him <laughs> partying yeah. or um I something love, like. I would love like a darker like a euphoria type of like take on the ducks that would be <laughs> I would watch that yeah. but um, I think I like uh I like Liam going to Eden Hall and then Charlie is sort of like he falls into the overbearing parent where he's like pushing Liam super hard and like talking with the coach behind his back and stuff like that. And it, I, he's going to sort of back off. I think the Eden Hall coach needs to be like an Easter egg, not like an Easter egg, but like an old, it can't be one of the ducks, but it has to be like an old character. Who, like everybody would recognize scooter or Cole. And what you could do yeah. is, Liam could be feeling, you know, the pressure from his dad. And he gives the same speech that Emilio Estevez gives in the breakfast club where he's like, man, I just wish my knee would give out. So my old <laughs> man. Would... <laughs> totally. Yeah, that would be great. Um, and then that kind of wraps up the, the sequel trilogy. But yeah. I think it's, it's, it is important that. I mean, again, like I said, I, I was just so disheartened with Game Changers. I was so upset. I didn't even – I could not deal with season two. I listened to the podcast, and I was like, I'm so glad I'm not watching this. Uh, and, like, no no shade out there. Like, I'm sure – I don't – I mean, do you guys know if, like, the people who wrote it were, like, fans of the original or if they were just, like, brought in to write the show? Do you guys know that? So the showrunners had – they – I mean, they came on our podcast and admitted that they, like – they had seen The Mighty Ducks, but they weren't, like, super fans, and they relied okay. on Brill there, and there some of the problem. other writers to do that. Um, so that – I mean, their whole idea was to give their take on it and then, you know, create a new generation, and it didn't quite work. We don't want so. that. We don't want that. <laughs> and yeah, I, I was – go ahead. In the, in the last – sometime in the last couple episodes, it was like I said – if you put take the word Mighty Ducks off season two and it's the same story, it's like this, you don't lose anything. Um, and we've also also talked about, you know, struggles with, you know, budget and things like that. And obviously losing Emilio and you have to rethink everything. So, you know, you, you need to make sure that you're giving them credit. But it was like, you know, that was their vision. Um, they might have been dealt a tough hand. Um, it just again, no one wanted kind of like that storyline Especially because, like, some of the kid kid characters, they really did like some yeah. good momentum. I feel, I feel bad for right. kids. Yeah. Um, residuals anymore. I feel bad for them about that. Yeah. Um. But maybe we'll we'll get a reboot. I'm trying to think like series that have just kind of like had a reboot and it's like, yeah, we're gonna we're not gonna acknowledge that. Well, okay, you know? I was I was thinking about this specifically when I wrote D four because Game Changers had already been canceled, and I was like, does Disney even care? about the ducks but then that super bowl commercial came out right where the ducks were in it and i was like okay they have to care about it a little bit because there were so many other movies that were not in this so like they have to care at least a little bit about the ducks so, so that we, had, we had joyce on and she mentioned like a wrap-up movie and like that was the first time i really thought that they like could come back in any way and i think 
I think that is the direction. Uh, Joshua Jackson, he was doing press for Fatal Attraction. And one of the things he talked about was he doesn't want to do things like in perpetuity. Like he doesn't want to do another series like Fringe. He like he didn't like that, like having to do 100 plus episodes. So he said one of the things that drew him to Fatal Attraction was it had like a definitive end. So I think a movie is more likely for him. Like, I don't think he wanted to be the main character in a series based on what he was saying uh, sort of tangentially with Fatal Attraction. So I think a movie is the key here. We get him, it goes, it ends. Maybe he does one or two more, but but it has an end. It's not going to be 10 seasons. So well, then, that's where I see it. Well, I didn't hear that, but I, that's, that's ext- I didn't listen to that interview. I think I saw a headline. But that is an extremely interesting point. And yeah, I think that's what I think D four is more realistic. I think honestly, that's what they should have done from the beginning was just do a D four. I don't know why that wasn't. I mean, I guess they want to like play to kids, but like you guys have talked about this, like kids are not, they're not checking for that. Especially, you know, I mentioned to Tommy, like I I work at Disney, and I've seen like a lot of young boys in Charlie Conway jerseys, like six, seven, eight years old. Like, so it is like they there are people that show their kids these movies and their kids love them and you know kids are not dumb like they're they're not dumb like they like like you know like I said I was a teacher like I know kids that love Full House and hated Fuller House because they can tell when I I mean I think Full House is bad too so that's not probably a good (laughs) example but uh you know I think it would be interesting I think we all want to see these characters back like I wasn't necessarily tuning in to the ducks every week but I did tune in for spirit of the ducks because I wanted to see you know my favorites again and I think that a lot of people feel that way like oh like these characters were kids when I was a kid and now they're adults and I'm an adult like that's such like a simple mindset but it does play very much to that I think it'll be interesting to see what is Disney's you know strategy over the next 10 years or is it just going to be Marvel and Star Wars Or can we get that like movie that was made for twenty five million and it makes forty five million and they're happy with it? Um, when when we talked to Jordan Kerner way back when, you know, producer is like Disney doesn't like to hit doubles. You know, they got to hit home runs. And you see like the sports movies they're making are the overcoming adversity based on a true story kind of bullshit. You know, not that it's all bullshit, but that's the <laughs> stuff. You're gonna get. Yeah. Um, you're not gonna get you know you're not going to get the mighty ducks, the little giants anymore, the big green, which is again, kind of not a shoestring budget, but it's, you know, people, you make it for 15 gross 30 and you're happy. Exactly. And I think that kids now don't have those type of movies anymore. They have Marvel yeah. and star Wars and like the big budget, like Disney movies. They don't have like, you know, like funny, like kids movies. Like there's no Goonies. There's no Sandlot. There's no anything like that. And I think that is interesting to, but it's also like, I want D4. Like, I don't need, I like if, if only D4 gets made, I'm fine with that. I don't need like a new generation of ducks. Like I want to see my ducks. And I think most people would agree with that. There you go. You have the script, Disney. We, we can send it. Hannah can send it to you right now. I would and... be more than happy to do that. <laughs> more than happy. You don't you even have to pay me. Carry it around in your backpack at work. Yeah. Honestly, oh Yeah. Yeah, that is like we do get executives coming in sometimes so yeah just slip it in their briefcase or something my question for you guys is if you could add anything to the script or if you could put any cameos in what would you add so this episode is getting dangerously long so let's i'm gonna try to keep it short i think we needed another sort of subplot like a b plot like i don't know if it's the hawks and like we get more of the hawks and their journey Or, you know, we learn more about Charlie and Amy or, you know, we we pick another duck. Uh, But some sort of B plot that's sort of like on the side that gives us a little break from Charlie and his, you know, angstiness, (laughs) I think. And maybe is a little funnier, um, too. That was another thing. I was like, oh, this is so not funny. Like, it needs needs more comedy for sure. Yeah. And so I think um, you you make Charlie and Amy um, separated. Um, mm. and, and you can kind of really lead into Noah as well, where maybe he's like, you know, kind of take, again, this is kind of going into what I was thinking for D5, but like Noah is becoming a bigger part of Charlie's life. Cause he's like, 
Noah is the kid that I like or whatever. He doesn't remind me of his mom. So maybe he's spending more time with Noah and then like Noah and Liam or maybe have some kind of thing there. I like the idea of like a Hawk subplot where it's just like, you could kind of get goofy with it where like Lars and Miguel were just like every like weekend. Like, begging, like Banks's apartment or something stupid. Yeah. yeah. And they, they always look at the film of that game. It's like, how did we lose? And it's like, <laughs> they play up the whole like, oh, we were so good back when we were 11. And, you know, it's like, mcgill's wife is like can you like stop talking about this bullshit and yeah. like come play with your son or something um yeah i think he could do that um as far as cameos i think it'd be funny if you have just like um carp kind of like always kind of being like he's ready he's got his skates ready and they're just like uh, now we're oh like um like newman in like space jam like that kind of <laughs> yes. like that yeah exactly <laughs> and maybe they like they look at him and there's like we need one more player and he's like, it's my time. And then Russ Tyler comes in or something. Nice. Yeah, that's yeah, good. I mean, yeah, that 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 definitely, I like that. And then I think, um, I really liked what you guys said about Gunner and like making the joke about him and Scooter being the same person. I don't know how I'd work that into this because like, I don't want him to be on the Hawks. You could do maybe like that's Julie's like, boyfriend and he's like yeah he's got like these alter egos or something or right she's like i dated this guy and then we broke up and i dated another guy and it was really similar or something i don't know yeah, yeah, yeah. he was like oh like i i found like his long lost twin from iceland or something like that <laughs> yeah all right i like it yeah i feel like we could talk this more we could really punch it up here so um who knows who knows what we'll maybe we'll have another episode or something but we'll we'll figure it out but because we could go probably another hour two hours on this but let's wrap it up here thank you to hannah again link will be in the show notes and for us the quackdick.com go there contact us at quackdickpod on twitter facebook.com slash quackdickpod go to itunes spotify wherever give us five stars write a review they say it helps you go up the charts i don't know if that's true or not but every other podcast says it so i'm gonna say it um hannah anything you want to pit any any plugs for you. Uh, Any- if you guys want to follow me on Twitter at Pacey Conway, um, please do. I would love to hear thoughts on the script. Um, keep it nice. But if you have anything you want me to add to it, I would be very happy to take some listener notes. So let me know. You know I'm always willing to want to improve my writing for the general fan base. There you go. And thanks to all our producers. Air Lemaire, I think. Still the most recent producer. Join the Discord. It's been fun in there. And remember, ducks fly together. Ducks fly together.